Are you ready to get serious about building content sites and building a profitable business online? Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. We bring you the latest field-tested tips, tricks, and strategies for building a profitable online asset. We interview industry experts, share customer success stories, and reveal our own experiences working on hundreds of sites to inspire and motivate you to make something happen. Let's do this. Welcome to the Niche Website Builders podcast and YouTube channel. I'm your host, Mark Mars. Today, I talk to Ismail Rickson, who is the executive chairman at FE International. FE International broker website deals and they are close to completing 1,000 deals since starting the company. We talk about how to scale up niche sites and the things you should consider so that you can maximize your sale price, something that's important to all of us. And we also talk about the insights that Ishmael has gleaned from the 1,000 deals I mentioned earlier and the trends he's seeing in this merger and acquisition space. Please like and subscribe to the show on YouTube and via your podcast app. And if you could rate and review too, we'd really appreciate it as it will help us grow the audience, allowing us to create more shows like this one. I hope you enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by Niche Website Builders, an agency dedicated to helping people just like you build profitable content sites. Niche Website Builders are the hands-off content site marketing agency you always wished existed. It's run by content site marketers for content site marketers, and they help both investors and individuals alike build profitable online properties. They provide a fully outsourced approach to content creation, link building, and done-for-you website builds, the same approach they use on their own six-figure portfolios. For example, their content packages come with a proprietary keyword research process, are written by in-house native English speakers, formatted using templates proven to convert, and uploaded to WordPress with affiliate links added so that all you need to do is hit the publish button. Check them out at nichewebsite.builders show. That's nichewebsite.builders show and fill out the form to get coupon codes for 10% more content or a 10% discount on links with your first order sent right to your inbox. Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Show. Today we speak to Ishmael Rickson, who is the Executive Chairman of FE International. FE International provide merger and acquisition advisory services for SaaS, e-commerce and content businesses. FE offers comprehensive exit plan services as well as access to an established network of pre-qualified investors to drive demand and maximize value for the clients they represent. Welcome, Ishmael. Thank you. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Thank you, Mark. So thanks for taking time out of your day. Really, really appreciate that. I know you're you're a busy man. Um, But before we get started uh, into the the meat of the episode, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and FE and and what the the role of an executive chairman is? (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Well, yeah, firstly, thanks very much for, for having me. I appreciate the introduction there. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, we uh, provide merger and acquisition services for uh, content, uh, SaaS and e-commerce businesses. And we've been doing that for the last uh, 11, 12 years uh, or so. And over that time, we've served, well, we've sold successfully sold um, nearly a thousand businesses at, at this stage. So very close to achieving uh, around a, a billion dollars in, in total acquisition value. Um, so our role, um, kind of what we help a lot of our clients do um, is really a lot of exit planning work, a lot of valuation work, helping them to optimize their businesses um, well ahead of a sale. Um, you know, there are lots of people that build businesses uh, out of passion projects that then become uh, you know, larger and larger over time. And there are people that are uh, that essentially are building businesses with a view to sell them in the future. But one of the, the home truths really is that either way, at some point in time, uh, you will be exiting your business. So you know, we like to get in and speak to people very early on in that process to use a lot of our proprietary and kind of uh, internal private benchmark data to, to help them um, in areas because obviously revenue growth and profit growth is, is very, very important, but there are lots of other ways to optimize businesses ahead of this a sale and lots of businesses, um, you know, go through different points and, you know, pivot in slightly different ways as they migrate to, towards that. So that's where we can provide a lot of value. And then we also do 
obviously the mergers and acquisitions part um, to actually take the businesses out and, and sell them to you know, a wide range of buyers, you know, private equity, um, funds, strategics, high net worth individuals. Um, you know, so that's very much the, the role that we play. Um, and, and me as, as executive chairman, I mean, there's actually a very new role um, that I've taken on um, this year. So we are we're somewhat unique in the way that uh, our founder, Thomas Smale, um, has after 10 years has not been pushed out of the company as you were, as, as lots of other founders, um, you know, after that kind of 10 year mark uh, sometimes happens, but you know, he's a, certainly a, a industry veteran, industry expert, you know, provides a huge amount of value to our, our team and our clients. Um, so he's actually taken over that role in terms of kind of growing and running the, the day to day business. And, and my job really is just to, well, firstly, you know, make sure that, that the company keeps providing a, a world class service, um, but then also with one eye to the future. So effectively, what I'm here to do is to make one or two, I would say, decisions a year to make sure that the the kind of the way we're we're aiming to position the industry uh, is in a sustainable, you know, a sustainable way, in a way that keeps growing, so that we can have um, secure, su- you know, successful um, you know, deal making for for sellers and buyers w- well into the future. Excellent. Thanks. That's a that's a great summary. So, I think um you know we'll we'll, we'll cover off some more of the kind of background story with FE International a bit, little bit later in the episode, and and uh, be good to hear a little bit you know about kind of some more insights into the industry and and uh, that you can share with us and you know help us all and help the audience um you know, towards kind of pushing forward towards you know selling that asset further down the road. And I think you know we've got a really exciting episode kind of lined up, which I think is going to help. A lot of uh, the people listening uh, to, to this uh, this show um, in making sure they can kind of get maximum value from 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 oh. their asset when, when they do decide to come and sell it further down the road. So today we're going to be talking about scaling up niche sites and and, and how you know what some some of the ways you can go about doing that. Um, and so one of the uh, yeah I guess the first question is kind of when you're thinking about you know scaling up niche sites in particular, then is, is there certain sort of different stages, different phases that you think of that a business goes through that, that, that sort of you know, push through into, into those kind of scaling up stages of a business as this kind of scales up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yes, there certainly are. Um, and I guess one one thing is that, you know, take a business from zero to one um, versus one to 100 usually involves a, a very, very different skill set. And arguably, I mean, and, you know, the skill sets are as challenging um, just Focus on very very different things. So that zero to one, um, you know, is the, is the the scary bit of um, you know nine out of ten businesses fail in their first year, etc. So that's where you know you really have to you know I say you, you have to be passionate about you know what you're doing. I mean, certainly there are trends to follow in the market in terms of you know which types of business model generally are seeing the most activity, um, most demand on on the buy side, which you should you know certainly be be looking towards. And our 2021 market report actually talks to a lot of that um, but then in terms of once you're you kind of identify a business model um, it's very I think it's very important to kind of dive into something you're actually um, passionate about because ultimately you know there's a lot of a lot of it comes down to consistency a lot of it comes down to you know setting a minimum time each day that you're going to actually put towards um, you know growing and running the project and a lot of people you know when they're going from that zero to one phase um, are actually doing it as a side project um, or you know a, a hobby on the side while they're kind of maintaining another form of income which is a very sensible thing to do and then as it grows or you know sometimes people have multiple ideas and multiple ventures they're working on and as one of them starts to establish as a bit of a leader in their portfolio they will then you know double down and and start to focus on that but that's very challenging to do if you generally don't have an interest in the kind of specific niche that you're in so you know i wouldn't say you know chase the gains in terms of uh you know you want to be running you know growing a content business you think this particular sector is going to be the most profitable over time because Lots of these sectors are cyclical, you know, peaks and troughs in demand, both throughout the year, but then, you know, in terms of kind of seasonality throughout the year, but then, you know, longer term as well. So I think if you really try and hone in and focus on something that you you care about, you will then it, you will then find it much, much easier to become an authority in a space. And if you if you go in with the view of you want to be the best, you know, number one worldwide or whatever it is you're producing or whatever type of content you're producing, the revenues and the gains will follow you from there. So I think, you know, creating, um, you know, on authentic um, kind of set of content and authentic brand um, around that and 
really being kind of personally vested in the type of content that you're writing um, really helps in that initial phase. And then once it starts to, to grow from there and you start to get you know, away from the zero and towards the, the one part of it, that's when you can start to you know, think about lots of other types of things and, and other distractions that on day one you really, really shouldn't be focusing on. Um, you know, but for example, as you start to grow, you know, these, these niche businesses, you know, starting to bring on teams, bring on agencies, et cetera. Um, but really you want to make sure that you have, uh, you know, a good subset of knowledge across a lot of different disciplines uh, you know, within the business that you've created. And you know, the only way to do that is to really have a passion for it in the first place. So uh, my, my advice is always go into the, the type of the type of business model that you know you you see long term doing well, uh, you know, be that a, a content business, but even then within content, drill down into you know, is it affiliate, is it display advertising, is it lead generation? You know, that's where you want to make your strategic assessment, and then beyond that, you really want to find you know, obviously do your research into the types of things that you could be then uh, writing and, and growing a business around, but select one that you are ultimately you know, that you ultimately do have that interest in. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I definitely agree to uh, to some extent of that. There's, there's definitely multiple schools of thought in, you know, starting you know, going down your passion project route, or, or or going for where the opportunity maybe is, but maybe it's not maybe it's not a passion. And I think there's definitely a lot to be said for if you're in it for the long term. If you want to be in it for the long term, then it, you should be probably something you're you're interested in. But also, I think if you're bootstrapping from the beginning, like if you're if you're doing everything yourself and you're writing about stuff you're much more likely to stick it out and continue it to the point it kind of starts making you some money if you're actually interested in writing about that topic and seeing it through um well, absolutely. And I think one thing I would, I would say to that is that, um, you know, when we speak to business owners and people looking to exit plan and sell their companies, there are lots of different reasons and lots of different, you know, angles as to why they ended up in the position. And, it, and the, the story is never, I went to business school, I wrote a business plan, and then I executed my business plan. It, there's always a, a very unique way in terms of, and I'm not saying people shouldn't go to a business school. I'm just saying that, that that's reasonably, uh, reasonably be rare in terms of you know a lot of the the six the multi-million dollar plus success stories that, that we we end up being involved with um but in terms of then who is actually looking to you know come in and acquire these businesses they are people that um have a, a much different set of a, a, a different set of objectives in terms of what they're trying to achieve so your average private equity firm or fund from for example their ultimate you know goal is profit maximization and return to, to you know their stakeholders so to them it's slightly less important in terms of you know what they're going to you know, are they passionate about a particular area because ultimately they will hire in the people that they need and they're not going to be necessarily running the businesses day to day themselves so they will be able to go out and find somebody or find an agency that has that expertise or or passion to come and actually do that for them um, whereas that person they got it from zero to one whether they were passionate necessarily at the start or whether that passion you know developed it and obviously businesses change and you know what you start out creating may look very different to what you end up um creating but yes the that underlying theme with with kind of the the founder side of the, the sellers that we work with certainly does exist yeah and i think that i mean there is another way to think about it. i think in, in so in terms of myself i'm the, i've you know i've got a bunch of sites that i've started i'm definitely not passionate about them all um and, and i hire people that you know writers that are kind of passionate about about the things that, that we're writing about, but I'm more passionate about the actual, the, the challenge of growing the site and it's the business aspect of it and kind of uh, making money out of a site and, and a, a vision I have for that project. I might, might not be passionate, passionate about that subject, but I'm passionate on a different level in terms of kind of trying to grow that as a site and as, as an asset. That's kind of a... Well, you, sh you should be an executive chairman then. That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll just change my title at Niche Website Builders. That's... But, but I mean, that, that, that's the thing, really. I mean, and sometimes you have to go through a process of creating a lot of different types of businesses, lots of types of sites to understand what you do and don't care about, because there are certain things that you may think at the start, this is real interest to me. And then when you dig in a bit, though, uh, you know, dig in a bit deeper, you realize it was surface level. And maybe there's something else that your natural, inqu uh, you, the, the kind of your inquisitive side of you uh, starts to care about more and more over time, which is why a, a lot of, you know, successful entrepreneurs uh, follow the route that, that you have, which is, um, you know, starting multiple things at the beginning and then seeing what develops naturally and, and kind of organically over time, both in terms of the, the business, but then also your interest around that as well. And then doubling down where, where you think it makes, makes most sense. Yeah. 
Great. Okay, so I'm day one. I'm in the trenches. I'm um, planning to build out my content site empire. You know, what sort of things should I be thinking about, like in the, in the, in the very early days? Well, yeah, I mean, the early days, um, really, I think the kind of the biggest advice I can give to somebody is it, obviously beyond everything we've already discussed and, and trying to create a lot of very authentic uh, content. I would say really you want to be kind of avoiding as many distractions as possible and focusing on you know, ways that you will ultimately, uh, you know, create revenues. And I, I do understand um, that and obviously we see tens of thousands of businesses every year. So we have a lot of insight into, you know, what people are you know, doing from at, at every kind of stage. But I do understand distractions are very easy to come by um, and not to say that these things you shouldn't be doing later on down the line but diversification is something you know you should think about a little bit later down the line all the networking is a little bit later down the line as well i mean obviously if you're looking to you know get into a, a SaaS business for example the the net a lot of that comes from word of mouth and referrals in terms of bringing new people on so the networking is a little bit more important earlier on in that process but if you're writing you know if you're starting a content business um you know really a lot of those more um 101 how to grow a business things are a little bit more applicable if, if further down so I, I would say very much it, it's a case of you know focusing on the content focusing on writing extremely high quality um, material uh, long form in, in the majority of cases um, and you know to, in and going back to my earlier point you know understanding every single different facet of the business at least to a stage where you can see where things are going right and going wrong and I think one of the, the great things with uh, you know businesses in this space in general is that there's a huge amount of data out there and you can effectively track nearly everything i mean i know google tries their best to uh, monetize a lot of that uh, of, of, uh, of people and, and they do change the rules every now and then as we saw you know last year was particularly active from uh you know algorithm updates and everything else um but but generally speaking there is a lot of data out there so i would say kind of don't ignore the data even though th there is I would say less. There's there's less of a connection um, in terms of real time feedback with your end users and your your end users. You do have to think about them from day one. So the more you can do to you know use heat mapping products, the more you can do to be kind of speaking to agencies, understanding kind of the real kind of driving metrics behind you know how to you know, how certain articles and, and other items rank. Um, I, I think the the more research and the more understanding you have around those areas, the the better off you're, you're going to be. But the data exists. Some people choose to ignore it. Some people choose to over focus on it i think there's certainly a balance between um both of those but i say at a very minimum you would obviously be kind of writing extremely thoughtful um it's going to be thoughtful long form content and then actually making sure to track you know, pull out as much data from that as possible and continuously tweak those articles um based off the the data that your end readers aren't necessarily telling you real time but they're telling you through their clicks actions and, and everything else that um you know goes into their kind of end experience yeah cool Okay, so, um, you know, I get, I get, so I get to this this point. I suppose we've kind of covered a little, little bit of those things, but I don't know if we can go to a little bit more detail on any of those aspects. But you know, I've got to the point now in in my journey of kind of scaling up my new site where I'm actually earning some money. Um, actually, I can kind of reinvest some, or if not, or or all of that money back back into into the business. Then you know, is there some consideration, you know, considerations of where I should actually start spending that money? Should I? ramp up building creating more content should i you know look to add in new uh, you know traffic sources or new revenue revenue streams H how does that work for in terms i guess from valuation further down the road what, what if i'm if i'm thinking about the exit and maximizing the, the the value of my business down the road no, absolutely. I mean, I think as the business starts to scale up a little bit, that's where you really need to, uh, you know, identify your strengths and weaknesses. And part of that will get back to our point before. We'll we'll come around. Well, where are the ele ele you know, elements that I have developed that I'm really passionate about? But for you, for example, it's the actual kind of growing of the business and you know monetizing and and finding new streams. Um, and, and that you know, if, if that's a particular strength, then double down on that and then start to hire in you know other people or agencies um, or kind of outsourcing content that um, you know come covering areas that you have you have built a technical competency in but you don't necessarily see yourself um, adding the most value day to day um, in that particular area and that certainly you know comes at different times but for different businesses but I would say you know there is a yeah, I think a lot of um, entrepreneurs, I mean, firstly, it is important to run these businesses in a profitable way. Um, profit's going to depend on the different types of businesses that you run. I mean, generally speaking, a, a content business um, below about five to 10 million in value, you should be looking at somewhere in the region of um, you know, 65, 75% uh, 
um, you know, margins throughout. So, you know, they can be run on a relatively lean basis, but a lot of the, you know, if, if you, if you start off a business as a, as a one person band and then, you know, continue to run it in that way, that's ultimately going to harm you longer term because a lot of the things that, um, you know, you've done to build up your rankings, to build up, you know, around kind of some very good content over time, you, you can't rest on your laurels with those. So really you have to keep, you have to keep that consistency going throughout. If you were doing a lot of link building, you have to keep that link building going. And just because you can't do it, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be getting someone else to, to kind of come in and, and do that as well. And, and there are certainly diseconomies of scale as it comes to yeah, as the business you know grows over time so usually that inflection point i would say is around the three million dollar level in terms of value um so you know that's usually the point where you start to have to hire in um you know quite a few people or bring in kind of quite a few agencies or a combination of those and and your margins may dip a little bit with the view of well longer term they're going to grow and, and then continue going up so if you start to experience that that's actually perfectly normal and it's not something to you know we're not looking to you know kind of cut anything back at that stage stage um, because the, the margins start to dip a little bit but you know, there will be inflection points as you as you go down the road and it is going to be you know, business specific ultimately but you should always be able to run these businesses in a, in a relatively profitable way but the profit comes from the the consistency and the compounding nature of the efforts that you've made in in lots of areas and I would say that you know, it's a mistake to cut back on content creation it's a mistake to cut back on on link building or, or anything else that you're kind of doing to maintain the the, the kind of uh, the the SEO uh, that has gone in, um, you know, uh, over time, because you know, Google is a is a if see big elephant in the room they are always going to you know optimize um you know their own platform as well and if you're not kind of keeping up to date and if you're relying on you know articles that you'd written three four five years ago um you know it sounds kind of legacy content to to continue to grow you know grow your business without adding additional items uh, in the future i think that's where you will struggle so i think you know the 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 real key is kind of identify the areas of interest you have your strengths and weaknesses and then bring other people in or bring in other agencies and the the good thing is that the more uh, you grow the businesses the more you actually have to spend to do that in the first place um so you know it it, it sometimes you know it's the case that people look to bring in very very cheap outsourced labor or very kind of cheap people internally to kind of do the bare minimum i mean i would argue that hiring one expensive person is better than hiring 10 uh, one very expensive but very very good person is better than hiring um you know 10 average people internally and then you know, not to just mention that the hr side of things that you then have to start to deal with which as, as businesses grow becomes um more of a consideration but the same can be said you know with agencies you may want to kind of bring in one very good agency to do something instead of trying to figure out how to you know scale a team internally so yeah i think that as you go up you have more money to spend you should be demanding better to results you know as you spend more as well but that's a i guess a, a luxury you have if you've been doing things um you know very well and very consistently consistently from day one as, as you do you will benefit from the compounding nature of those efforts yeah i concur with that i think i mean you know, what i see time and time again is that the most common reason for you know a lot of the people we work with are, are just starting out or or, or, or only certain way, certain way down the road and i'm you know, the most common cause of kind of failure, I guess, is that they just, they just give up too soon. Like, they, and, and, and like the, 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 I guess they start off really passionate, put loads of effort in, they'll write 20 blogs and then, and, and not see the results they were hoping or expecting. Cause that's a kind of, for one person on their own, that's some, you know, quite a lot of effort to get the, you know, even to get like a blog a week out is kind of a, quite a lot of effort if you're working in your own time. Sorry, if you've got a full time job and you're doing it in, in a part time. So we definitely see that. And I think I totally agree that uh, with like making sure you got to, you don't rest on your laurels and you've got to continue churning it out and, um, and, and keep, because it is a, like I say, it's a compound effect. And if you just keep going, as I say to a lot of people, just keep going. Like if you just keep going, it will, you will get there. That persistence will pay off. Well, you're, you're completely right. And I think the, usually the, the payback that we see when we're doing a lot of our data is about six to 12 months um, in terms of people investing uh, in content or bringing agencies in um, to kind of start to improve their, or kind of grow their, their rankings over time as well. So I, I think that that is that. That is where a challenge exists um, because ultimately you know, that is that can be quite a significant um, investment. But then it really comes down to what are you looking to do with the business? What are your goals? What like is this a, is this going to forever remain a side project, or once it takes off, are you going to you know look to you know 
double down and go you know full time on this and then continue investing in, into the future but the, the good thing is that um you know a lot of these investments that, that are made especially a lot of the capital intensive investments um that are made from a valuation perspective you know one, two years down the line, um, obviously you should continue to invest in them, but you may not have to invest at the same rate you're investing at, at the very beginning um, from, a, from a standing start, if you would. So, you know, a lot of the, the, the costs do come down, margins improve again. That's my point about diseconomies of scale. And some of these items can actually end up being added back. And that's obviously a case by case basis. But, um, you know, especially when there are kind of lots of you know, development projects and those kind of items that are slightly more one time in their nature, that's where there is a bit of discretion. Um, Based off what you know, we see buyers accepting in the market as well. So I mean, people should, you know, sort of entrepreneurs should be should, should be kind of continuing to invest in, in this. But you you are completely right that it's not an overnight thing. And and quite frankly, if it was an overnight thing, um, you should not be interested in doing it in the first place because you're not building a defensive moat. Um, and if anybody can come along and get results in a month, then what's the point of you investing any money in it in the first place if it's if it's that simple and that easy which is why there are you know like like yours expert firms out there that that kind of take a lot of the data that they've learned um from kind of uh, doing this time and time again and apply that in actually six or 12 months which is quite a short you know period of time if you look at the average lifetime of, of a business in general yeah um yeah you mentioned about costs being added back there just for people who are not familiar with that that what that means could you explain what that is yeah, certainly. So a lot of businesses, we actually use something called um, seller discretionary earnings. So we effectively take your EBIT or EBITDA number and then we're adding back items that are either discretionary to the way you have chosen to run the business or discretionary in terms of um, one time ex you know, expenses that are not expected to continue either at the same rate. Uh, or, or generally into the future. I mean, the caveat is that does also exist for revenue. So it's not just the case that um, items can be excluded from a uh, the, the cost schedule in your, in your in the profit and loss, but it also can include if there are big one-time um, you know revenue items that are not expected to continue. And the reason that's worth mentioning is because obviously you know 2020 um, you know, extremely eventful year um, you know, in terms of um, you know, obviously everything that's, that's happened pandemic wise uh, around the world um, and coming out off the back of that a lot of business a lot of you know, tech enabled and tech focused businesses um, a lot of content businesses SaaS e-commerce after the initial hiccups with FBA uh, Amazon FBA being able to you know, f fulfilled the demand that, that was coming through and getting inventory into the warehouses in time. Um, a lot of these businesses actually did extremely well throughout the year. Um, however, if you look at the historic performance and you look at the way um, the kind of rankings have, have developed so, uh, over that, that period as well, you realize a lot of it's just coming from kind of increased uh, increased searches as opposed to kind of actual uh, organic growth in the business. And a lot of that will then come back down again um, in 2021. So the, the discretionary element does, um, you know, and the add back element does apply to the revenue line as much as it applies to the um, uh, uh, to the cost line. But yes, I mean, the way you choose to run a business may not be necessarily optimized for a sale. And one of the things that buyers are very interested in is having a business that um, has continuous investment for the long term. But they do realize that ultimately, if you wanted to purely maximize profits, potentially at the harm of the business, you could strip out a lot of things you could strip out the content creation you could strip out a lot of the kind of agency and seo work and you may not see any effects of that for you know six to 12 months but after that period the the slow moving train will actually come to a halt and then a buyer will be left in a rather precarious situation so they want you to continue investing in these things and a lot of the items especially a little bit more one time um you know in, in nature they you know they, they will you know be, be very accepting to add that back because they realize that ultimately they will be the beneficiaries of that investment not necessarily you so you shouldn't be always penalized for that within the within the, the profit loss statement and within the the kind of valuation as well i mean content creation i mean for a content business that is the lifeblood of it so i mean you, you wouldn't expect really kind of content to be to be added back so to speak um you know sometimes there are kind of big one-off pieces projects um or kind of you know you're starting to experiment with you know paid advertising or some of those other things um you know a lot of those experimental things especially you know there is a lot of trial and error and there is error involved with, with trial and error so a lot of those things that don't necessarily materialize um you know that's certainly something we would dig into to see well do the metrics support adding this back um or, or was it actually kind of more beneficial from a branding and other aspects that, than you may think but th there is certainly a discussion around every item um that we look at in terms of the, the profit and loss and that's really why you know we like to get involved very early on in the process so we can we can help uh, you know, people and, and uh, help entrepreneurs understand you know 
these are the areas that we could potentially add back in the future relative to, to your specific business. So keep investing in them today because eventually they will actually kind of drop off. Um, but the investment now is something that will, will help the kind of long-term equity value of the business. Yeah, cool. That makes sense. So we spoke a little bit about, you know, things like adding additional traffic sources, adding additional revenue streams, kind of once you're a little bit more established and further down the road. Do those things kind of reflect in the sale price at the end? You know, if you've got multiple revenue streams, different traffic sources, is that something that's, that will help you get a better demand, a better price when, when you come to sell? Well, yeah, I mean, and there are actually two elements to that. So firstly, there is the multiple itself, um, but there's also the structure of the deal. So a business that has one revenue stream, highly, re and obviously, you know, let's exclude kind of, uh, let's exclude kind of AdSense for, for the purposes of this, given it's, it's um, obviously a very large part of, of many businesses. But, um, you know, you, you, if a business is kind of overly reliant on kind of one particular type of, of, of revenue stream and you get beyond a certain level, uh, I would say kind of into that seven and eight figure range, um, I certainly think that's where buyers do, um, are looking for, for diversification. Uh, and, you know, uh, and that almost comes as standard. But again, it would be very difficult to, to build a business off one revenue you stream if you're kind of focused on in content uh, 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 and you know, around um, it's difficult to kind of build a business to that stage with just one revenue stream anyway. So you are going to continuously add over time. A lot of that will come from kind of wanting to test and experiment. A lot of times you will actually be approached as it gets bigger and people trying to bring you on to their particular partner and media networks and, and other kind of things. And it's always worth that experiment, especially as you know, they can get quite competitive in terms of the, the kind of um, rates they're going to offer for particular you know, types of traffic as well and i think it's been very interesting to see over the past couple of years the battle between you know people moving off adsense going on to media vine ad thrive etc and i think you know, that is now especially as a lot of those kind of networks have brought in minimums in terms of um amount of kind of traffic volume they see you know we've got a lot of buyers specifically looking for businesses focused around kind of alternatives i would say to to, to adsense but yes generally you're going to want to, to add those over time i mean Back to our earlier point, you don't want to do that at the very beginning. You just want to get some revenue on the books and start growing and start reinvesting. But just from your, you know, your own uh, protection, I would say, uh, and and obviously kind of what buyers are looking for, that that does become more important as a business grows. And it it means ultimately that the, the multiple is going to be slightly higher. But I think the more important bit is the structure is going to be much more in your favor as well. If there's a over reliance around one area, it wouldn't be uncommon for you know buyers to come in and say, well, listen, we're only paying. 50, 60 percent upfront for this business, and we're going to put a performance element in to, you know, or a holdback element in um, to, to save against these specific risks we we see in the business. And at that stage, you are you are actually burdening a lot of that risk going forward as well. So these are items that could be mitigated by starting to diversify a bit. But there is no hard and fast rule in terms of 25 percent needs to come from here, 25 percent from here, or anything like that. It, every business is going to be a, a little bit different, but generally you should be always test, you know, always be testing as you. Um, as you grow anyway. And I think that will develop naturally over time um, for, for each business in question. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I think you're right. I mean, we'll come, well, maybe we could cover it now, but I mean, I'm guessing you don't have too many, at least eight figure content businesses, pure content businesses um, on, on on your marketplace, but, or that you sell. Well, actually we, so uh, is that we've actually just sold one uh, at 16 million um, uh, in terms of uh, what one that's just got gone out in, in, in the past couple of weeks. So, I mean, we do we do get, uh, you know, uh, eight figure deals. I mean, I think the last the biggest one we sold last year was 12 million from memory. Um, so they, they do exist. But one of the one of the and our, I think our market outlook piece um, that's just been launched is, is covering that does cover this as well. Um, what we're finding is because of their because there are a lot of a lot more places you can now sell a business and a lot of marketplaces out there. Um, so you know, think uh, you know, Flipper and those sort of places. A, a lot and a lot of Facebook groups actually uh, where people can go in and actually sell their businesses directly to to kind of people who want to ha have a bit a start a site that you know has has got a little bit of traction. May not be necessarily monetized or maybe monetized to a very low level. Um, a lot of people are actually exiting much, much sooner than we would have seen um, years, you know, years gone by. So you know, people get to that stage kind of where they start to hit a, a mid five figure valuation level and they think, well, I've learned the lessons here. I know how to do this. I can do this across 10 different businesses and 10 different niches. I want to scale up my operation and you know, I will take the 
you know, the, the money today and sell the business and go off and do that and repeat that 10 times. And then, you know, obviously, uh, in theory, we have 10 times as much. So a lot of people are actually exiting sooner. And I think that's um, that's one thing that um, is starting to limit a little bit the kind of total value that you see with with some of these uh, some of these businesses. And I think the fact that the industry is growing, there are more and more buyers out there, um, you know, certainly helps that trend in general. Um, and then the other thing, obviously, is that, you know, Google has, is extremely active when it comes to um yeah, the changes they're making to the algorithm. And I certainly understand why they're doing it. I understand that, you know, for them, name of the game is, uh, you know, extremely relevant searches to people. And, you know, that will, that, that's, you know, something that we just have to be cognizant of uh, over time. But it also means that, you know, some businesses, as they grow, they may get scaled back a little bit and then they have to start that process again to, to, to grow. So it can take a, a little bit longer. But generally speaking, you know, we see in content businesses, you know, to grow a, a business into the six figure level, let's say, that that's one to two years of, of solid work to grow it into the seven figure level. You're looking more kind of, you know, between two to four years and then the, the eight figure level, you know, beyond that uh, again as well. So, you know, with the, the readily accessible you know, buyers that you now have out there, a lot of people are, are just choosing to, to sell much, much earlier, which is starting to limit the, 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 I would say size of the, of the overall market in terms of businesses that are, are available. But um, yeah, that, that's kind of, you know, that's our challenge really to kind of help people and, and show them earlier on in the process, you know, there is a bigger exit for you down the road if you can just do X, Y, and Z. And here is the, here is the empirical data that we have to help you, you know, get there in terms of the, you know, benchmarking your, your overweight in this area. So maybe double down or your underweight relative to the market in this area. So maybe you want to consider reinvesting and that can actually get you to a, a, a better point, you know, much sooner than you may otherwise think. Okay. Okay. So, so these, um, 12 million, 16 million deals, uh, their monetization, you know, is it, was it purely ads and affiliate or, or, or what, how, how was that one monetized? Um, so the, the 12 million one specifically, I can't go necessarily into names, but the, the 12 million one specifically, that was, um, that was affiliate and that was a combination, uh, of, of, yeah, like, of a few different kind of, uh, affiliate kind of, uh, networks they, they were using there, as you would well expect. And that was a, a high growth business. Um, and, you know, from, from, it has continued to do well from, from our understanding, um, you know, in terms of, in terms of kind of, you know, how that business developed post acquisition, which I mentioned was you know, a couple of years ago now. Um, in terms of uh, the the 16 million one, um, that was actually a, a lead generation business. Um, but again, lots of testing, lots of optimizing across kind of different lead gen partners. And, and lead gen is actually you know, a, a very good way. I mean, obviously niche niche specific niche dependent, um, but but niche, lead generation is a very good way um, because ultimately the you know you are actually kind of starting to gain um, kind of more revenue uh, from the kind of you know the the, the end conversion point. Of effectively there. And you have to deal with different challenges there. So you have to deal with scrub rates. You have to deal with you know, the lead generation partners changing commission rates a lot of the time as well. So it's not you know necessarily always that simple, but the ticket price ultimately is a lot higher than you're getting you know, from a display advertising on a CPM basis, but for example. So um, you know, th that where we do see the businesses scale a, a little bit further, they do tend to be, um, I would say, kind of generally affiliate or, or lead generation based. Okay. That makes sense. Um so you spoke a little bit about um, you know some people selling earlier and, and and therefore kind of branching out and almost having a portfolio of kind of businesses. Then um, is that something? I mean, you're seeing it more regularly now, more commonly. Uh, is you know, is there is there you know when you're when you're doing that kind of exercise, is there a point where you need to consider that you know you've got to scale that portfolio as well? Therefore, again, you've got you've got different challenges in that you've got more than one asset to kind of look after and handle. And you know, how have you seen that? with the people that, you, you, that you're aware of that have kind of taken that move? Well, yeah. And, and you know, I think that that comes back, back down to kind of the, the strengths and weaknesses point. But yeah, I mean, in terms of what we've seen over the past couple of years, um, I guess just to put some of this in context for you, I mean, content now, um, you know, it used to be kind of one of the larger parts of our business. It accounts today for about 40, uh, I would say about 40% of the volume of businesses that we sell, but about 10% of the value of businesses that we sell. And kind of comparatively, e-commerce is about 10% of the volume, but about 40% of the value. Um, and then SaaS is about 50-50 um, you know, on each. So um, yeah, I mean, so that's kind of the, the trend that we're, we're observing at the moment. I mean, we do think that we will, you know, more will be done in terms of value this year as well, um, you know, kind of 2021, as you know, a lot of the changes hopefully have been made 
by Google and other partners in in uh, in 2020, and then and hopefully they'll um, you know, they'll uh, leave the businesses to grow for for a little while. But I mean, generally, as you start to run a portfolio, that's where you do need to think about you know, op that, that's where you do need to think about optimizing your time. Where is that time uh, you know best spent? How can you bring in kind of uh, different uh, partners, different agencies? Maybe you know maybe that's expanding your team. Maybe it's kind of you know outsourcing. Maybe it's, it's doing a little bit of both. But that's where you know the the, the game that, that people tend to see is the lessons that they've learned. They don't need to relearn them. So if you go from zero to one with you know, kind of your first business and you you kind of are learning how to write you know, very good content, you're learning how to you know actually kind of rank that content and then learning to monetize it. You know those lessons on day one for the next time. And you don't necessarily have to do them yourself, but you know how to instruct somebody how to do them, or you know how to find an agency or, or an outsourced service that can do it to the, the levels and the standards that you want them to, to be performing at. Um, and I think that's kind of a, obviously going to be a bit of trial and error there as you go. But I would say that a lot of the areas that get um, you know, outsourced um, come down to link building, uh, content creation in, in general as well. But I think the one thing that you will probably struggle to outsource is um, the, the monetization, um, optimization side of it, because that will always, you know, that, with anything, that's dynamic. It continues to change, um, and I think that really, you know, that's something that should ultimately lie with the founder. That's kind of one of the highest value adds um, that, that you can have in terms of negotiating, especially let's say lead generation businesses, negotiating slightly better rates. I mean, you would want to be kind of taking control of those kind of conversations, but you can only do that if you've actually removed yourself from other parts of the business. And as, as a business scales, I mean, there are inflection points when you get past the million dollar valuation level, you're really going to be, you know, it would be rare to have, um, I'd say kind of a million dollars, you could run a business in terms of value, you could run a business with one to two people. As you start to move beyond that, you know, buyers would start to get a little bit suspicious if you didn't have agencies, didn't have outsourcing, you know, didn't start to have a, a bit more of a team in place. So I'd say, you know, beyond that kind of million level is where you, should, you know, it becomes a little bit more about you know, the, the human capital side of things, as well as kind of just knowing how to grow businesses. And in order to spend your time actually doing that and develop and build, you know, culture internally and culture externally with the, your kind of partners that you work with, you need to be removing yourself from a lot of that other, those other day-to-day -day items. But you will obviously have the knowledge of what success looks like because you would have done that from, from day one yourself as well. So I think having the knowledge is important, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to be the one that, that is doing it every time. There is a, there is a, an argument, or there is a, the, 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 the delegate to elevate element to, to look at, whether you choose to do that internally or externally is kind of completely down to, to your, the scale that you want to achieve. Yeah, totally makes sense. Excellent. Thanks for that. So we, I know that in the coming weeks, a couple of weeks or so, or you're, you're planning to uh, release your 2021 market outlook report. So I think by the time this episode airs, I suspect it'll be out. How, how long is it before it comes out now? Uh, yeah, I think it's actually coming out. So we start, of, well, I guess, right now, so the start of February. So I think it'll be out in the next week or so. Um, so yeah, that, that that should be very good. And that, that's actually a, a very interesting report. I mean, we haven't done one for a couple of years now. Um, yeah, in the same way that we've done this particular one, we, we provided reports of here is what our company is doing, but we haven't actually dug into. I mean, we dig into the data on a, a you know, daily and weekly basis internally, but we haven't done, uh, published a report for a good few years um, that kind of actually shares a lot of that data. Um, you know, out there as well. And I think one reason that we're doing it now um, is that um, you know, there are a lot of 2020 has, has led to a lot of new participants coming into the space, especially from a buyer perspective. And we want to make sure that buyers have um, access to that information and understand where these businesses trade and the, the real value drivers that successful entrepreneurs have been uh, have managed to achieve. And and frankly, a lot of the difficulty that has gone into uh, into achieving that. So you know, I think one trend that we're noticing from a you know, in terms of the buyers is that we're seeing a lot more private equity firms, a lot more funds. Um, strategies have always existed and will always exist and, and high net worth individuals uh, who are often made up of successful kind of internet and, and tech entrepreneurs themselves as well. They already have a, a very good understanding, but oftentimes the more private equity side, um, you know, they do want access to you know, some of this information to understand how the industry has developed over the past 10, 15 years. And that's really what this, this report is aiming to do. So really showing kind of what happened last year and the years before that, but then also kind of what we, you know, the, the, what we think is going to happen in the next couple couple of uh, 2021 certainly and then looking forwards from that as well and, and providing as much information and as much as, as much kind of data and empirical information as we can to, to help support that okay so a little bit of an, uh, an insight into the report so so what, what are some of the, the broad broad 
sort of forecasts that you've you've made in in, in 2021 for for M&A? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So in the report that we are, you know, 2020, you know, one of the big things that we, uh, you know, that we continue to see was the multiples that are going up in general um, across the board. I mean, different types of business model you know, going up for, for different reasons, um, which I'm, I'm happy to get into. Uh, but generally speaking, it's positive, it's positive news across the board there. Uh, but that has been growing in a ver- relatively linear fashion in, in most sectors, I, I would say, for a reasonably long period of time. So, yes, there are lots of big tech IPOs out there. That doesn't necessarily that isn't necessarily a reflection of what you see um, in the kind of you know seven and eight figure range. Uh, you know necessarily um, there is you know some element of trickle down there, but the the industry is actually re- you know, extremely sustainable in its kind of growth and, and that it's seen uh, over the years. So you don't see kind of big up and down spikes, which is I, sh- I would say kind of very good when it comes to uh, actually building a business from scratch. To know that the industry will continue to be there, multiples will continue to be there in in years to come, and there is some element of predictability around that. Um, I mean. E-commerce is an area where we have seen a lot of growth. There are lots of, um, you know, funds that are, you know, have kind of purpose raised um, capital to go out and do, you know, roll up strategies. Um, and and I, I suppose that's relevant because a lot of kind of people that are, uh, you know, a lot of people that are now in e-commerce come from a content background. So, you know, they've kind of, a lot of people have actually been making the switch over from from one to the other. Um, so, you know, but generally speaking, you know, I would say that the multiples will continue to go up. Content specifically, we expect there to be a, a slight increase in terms of multiples, just off the fact that they're, you know, once you've gone through a year, firstly, where you know, businesses have been uh, have performed very well because you know general internet searches have have been going up off the back of a lot more work from home, a lot more people kind of looking to you know do things during lockdown and those kind of items. Um, you know that that is something that uh, you know that, that, that people uh, kind of investors are you know, are actually betting that longer term that trend is going to continue. Maybe not at the same rate that that we saw in 2020, but a lot of the people that have discovered new you know, new content sources, new blogs, new kind of areas. I mean, they don't lose that information. They don't lose the the kind of knowledge that those things exist. And I think that that will that will continue to to grow over time. But then also, you know, as there there is a, a bit of a flash and burn in terms of um, you know a lot of the Google updates that have happened, it actually leaves kind of fewer higher quality businesses out there. So then you know, demand versus supply, um, you know, it, it balances more in, in the favor of the the business owner there as well. So for you know very high quality businesses, we'll see kind of the multiples continue to to grow in the context content space. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of one big thing that, that we're expecting for, for this year. So everybody who's kind of you know out there and you know continuously investing and plugging away, you know, there is a there is certainly you know light at the end of the tunnel in terms of you know, the multiples that are are slowly expanding and have done for at least the past decade and we'll expect them to do the same going into into the rest of this one. Yeah. So what in sort of twenty twenty and what do you see in twenty twenty one in general are the are the, are the the multiples of the various different business models. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, that it, it does vary um, a, a little bit, and I guess before, kind of, uh, worth just giving a bit of context around multiples in general. I mean, businesses that are going through different types of trajectories, so growth businesses. Um, you know, we're not always going to be using kind of a last twelve month multiple. There is a case where, yeah, there are cases where we can extrapolate um, kind of earnings out into into the future in those cases as well to kind of give credit to you know the, the kind of compounding nature of, of growth that the businesses see. Now, with content businesses specifically, that could be a little bit more challenging because there is some seasonality within that and seasonality is is more and more accepted these days obviously you know especially let's say affiliate content businesses uh you know amazon of okay, e-commerce i would say in general kind of drives a lot of affiliate revenues around q4 of the year and then we always see it drop off kind of midway through or post january for, for a few months before it starts to recover so depending on when you then take that and that kind of um, extrapolated multiple could have a quite a significant effect. So we would actually use a, an adjusted seasonal multiple uh, in, in a case like that. But but generally speaking, I would say kind of well-run high margin um, kind of content businesses that are on um, a form of growth trajectory, either if that's consistent or a consistent monthly growth or annual monthly growth. I mean, you're seeing them trade anywhere between, I would say, two and a half to four times on the higher end. Um, but that, again, really comes down to the absolute volume and kind of size of the business in general, you are going to start seeing multiples increase as the businesses go up. And it goes back to that point that we spoke about before about just general rarity of kind of businesses in that seven and eight figure range for, for all the reasons in terms of you know people maybe cashing out a little bit too early or um you know a lot of the update update pieces there uh, uh, as well. So I think that's the broad range. What time frame or what you know what the actual PL that gets applied to will certainly change 
um, you know, depending on the growth trajectory of the business. So it's unfortunately not as simple as saying, you know, this business is worth, you know, a business is worth X multiple because, um, you know, that valuation exercise, you know, it does need to kind of drill down into the kind of the long-term value um, that's there. And sometimes that means be taking a slightly shorter cohort, expanding that out. Sometimes it means actually kind of using last six, last 12 months, last 24 months, uh, you know, in a, in a, you know, I guess in, in cases where businesses are flat, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. You can use last 36 months, it, it would make a huge difference. But the real growth businesses, which I think is where a lot of these businesses are in that kind of first one to two, one to three years from inception, that's when we would be using a much tighter time frame and doing a lot of exercise, a, lot of, a kind of big exercise around kind of forecasting that forward. So um, the, the multiple kind of comparison methodology of valuing is very useful but we're also looking at um, discounted cash flow models we're also looking at historic price regression revenue regression and then it's a combination of of those and a weighting of those that will ultimately take to to value businesses but the sooner we speak to you know founders entrepreneurs to start that valuation work the better understanding they they could have of a you know, how the valuation metrics affects their specific business because no two businesses are the same so that's why you know there are problems you know, there, there certainly were in years gone by, they probably still exist today. There are lots of kind of online valuation tools, lots of articles written about the subject, but ultimately you will always leave value and money on the table if you kind of take a rule of thumb and try and apply it to, to your business. It's worth finding and speaking to a, a specialist firm that can that can handle that for you. Yeah, sure. Excellent. Um, so in terms of demand, I mean, you mentioned that the, the percentage of your uh, the split between the, the, the kind of businesses that you're working with, um, the, the split of content sites actually went down to, to 10%. But I guess from what I'm seeing is like there's still a, a growth in demand for all, for content businesses, and therefore I assume all business models. Is that is that true? What yeah, that, that's right. And, and yeah, so, so you know, I said, yeah, so the, the start was, you know, 40% of our volume is content, but about 10% of the, the total value. And that's just, you know, e-commerce and you know, SaaS has remained relatively on kind a of linear upward trajectory. E-commerce, um, you know, has, has been growing in terms of kind of value. I mean, specifically, we only deal in seven and eight figure e-commerce businesses, generally speaking. So, you yeah, know, that's maybe somewhat why that data is coming through there. But um, in terms of, I guess, content in general, yes, we, we are always going to see um, you know, a, a large demand for that because what a lot of other businesses can do is they can take um, you know, well-established you know, blogs, publications, and they can actually use that to be monetized in, in other ways as well. So you have all the people who, you know, all the buyers are looking to actually come in with the subject matter expertise and want to run these businesses as going concerns and make them you know, bigger and invest more capital and make them uh, you know, even more profits over time. But then you also have other companies that are looking to come in, especially I would say kind of SaaS businesses, e-commerce businesses, they may come in and try to you know, acquire some of these to reduce their own customer acquisition cost away from paid advertising at other areas. So there are a few kind of different dynamics, um, you know, pushing the multiples up over time. And again, you know, with Google, um, you know, continuing to kind of change the algorithm, you know, you, you tend and people kind of you know, exiting a little bit earlier than they, they were in years gone by, um, you know, that that supply versus demand or the, like, is really now in the favor, in, in the favor of the of the founder. So, you know, the, that's why the you know, seven and eight figure content businesses are going for you know more towards i would say the you know high threes four times multiple range again that could be an extrapolated number so that could end up looking five six seven times in terms of what your actual last 12 months was if it was a it is a growing business um but you know th there is certainly um you know i say limited supply at, at that level so that there is a, a lot of demand when it comes uh, from, in, in terms of buyers right thanks that makes that, that totally makes sense yeah thanks thanks for sharing that so i think this is, it's taken me a lot longer to get to this point than I was hoping to, but I think that's because we've had lots of good conversations. But I mean, I, I personally don't know the, the startup story for FE and how it all began. So, yeah, I'd really love to hear, you know, how it all started for you. No, absolutely. So I guess one thing to, to mention is that um, I'm not actually the, you know, I'm not one of the, the, the founders of FE. So mm. Thomas is actually the, the, the founder um, and uh, he brought me in, I guess, to to the you know the the point we were making earlier, he brought me in when he realised that you know at that particular um, stage he wanted somebody that had a slightly different skill set that could bring um, a little bit more of the okay how do we run and grow a business um, as opposed to the the necessarily just the, the subject matter expertise which he had then and, and continues to have. I mean he is he is he has certainly helped to make the market over the years in terms of his his general experience um, and, and kind of continues to add value um, to this day. But so. I came in, um, I would say, around kind of 
two years in or so, so to the company. Um, and then from there, really, we, we you know, we, we doubled down on the, the merger and acquisition side of the business. I mean, at the beginning, you know, we did a, a few kind of different things and, uh, you know, we, we, we had a bit of asset management. Um, so can you hear that or in, no, it's in the fine. background? No, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so, so we we had a bit of, uh, we did a little bit of asset management work in the early days and um, yeah, a little bit of content creation and website management as well and you know I I effectively came in uh, after about two years and I realised that hey we're actually spending um, I would say we were spending about ninety percent of our time on about ten percent of our revenues and I thought well if we just switch this the other way around and and give that a go instead uh, then you know I think we we, we do all right and then from there you know it was it was just the the two of us and then from there we effectively um, you know just it was a compounding nature. It's day in, day out, turning up, doing the work, and and the, eventually your your reputation starts to proceed you a little bit, and, and that's where um, you know now we really just rely on on inbound, and that's kind of one thing that we're particularly proud of is that there's a lot of word of mouth, a lot of referrals, a lot of clients that have had kind of you know success stories, but uh, by by working with us. Um, but you know that is the, the the long game in terms of in terms of what we've done. Um, you know now the company is, is very very different. We have you know we're, we're uh, you know, well into the the three digits in terms of the number of staff that we have. Uh, we have offices in London, New York, San Francisco, and you know, just opening one up in uh, in Miami, Florida now uh, as well. So uh, the company today is, like I said, extremely different to where it, it was before, but we are we are positioned and we have positioned ourselves to, you know, certainly um, you know, help people that are, you know, in the seven and eight figure and then going beyond that to, to exit, value exit plan and, and, and sell, um, ultimately sell their, their companies. Excellent, cool. Like I said, I think this is the, the the last thing I want to touch on is that you know from time to time you you um, raise money for uh, private equity funds. Um, that, that that's the case. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't think you got one open at the moment, have you? Or have you? No, no, not 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 at the moment. So yeah, we we've actually done. Um, so we've actually raised seven funds um, over the years. Yeah, it does form a, a private equity uh, model in that sense. Um, and, and in terms of of kind of the reason that we've done that, so we have about sixty four thousand uh, qualified invested investors in our network. As our report shows, that's actually close. Well, over twenty billion dollars in via demand that we have in our network. Um, however, not everybody in our network necessarily wants to run the the day to day of the business themselves. They just want the exposure um, to, to, to the asset class. So uh, we, we do have a fund. The fund actually really focuses on SaaS um, because that, that kind of leans itself very nicely to the to the fund model with the compounding nature of, of those revenues. Uh, and that's something that we've seen a huge amount of, of success with uh, over the years. So you know our, our returns kind of speak for themselves in that respect. I mean, it is just for incredi- accredited investors. Um, and, and it's something that is actually kind of, you know, managed kind of separately, you know, from, from the kind of day to day, you know, in actually a separate office and you know, day to day business. So that, that's kind of a, you know, something that we're extremely passionate about. We, we like running businesses. We find it extremely interesting as well. We don't just sit here saying, here's what the data says. So we have no experience. Go and go and give that a go and let us know how it works out. Um, you know, we, we do, we, we are, you know, involved in the, in the day to day running of, uh, of kind of, you know, small growing and profitable companies as well. So, um, but yeah, like I said, the, the fund at this stage is because I mean, we, we are probably going to do a public fund um, in terms of the, the next round. So that may be in kind of 2022 or, or 2023. So starting to go after, you know, more institutional capital than um, you know, just, just accredited uh, capital there as well, um, which is more a, a state of the, of the kind of financial markets and, and where they are now um, th- th- themselves as well. But yeah, that's something that we are um, you know, p- passionate about. I mean, it's, it's, you know, relatively small compared to, FE these days in terms of kind of, you know, what FE is doing. And, you know, we sell about, I would say, close to 120, 130 businesses a year um, on that side of things. So, and for comparison, the fund may buy, you know, three to four businesses a year, yeah. um, businesses that aren't being kind of represented through our, our own network. That's usually done through kind of outreach and um, we're finding strategic opportunities that make sense for a, for a specific fund. But again, it, it does serve some of the buyers in our, our network that, you know, are more interested in the exposure as opposed to the, the day-to-day aspect of, of running businesses. Yeah. Are you able to share some of the numbers around the, the returns on the funds that you've, that you have? 
Um, well, yeah, I mean, all, all the funds have, have varied. I mean, typically speaking, so we just raised another, um, well, actually, we were oversubscribed for our last fund. So we were over $20 million in terms of the total raise um, that we did there. But yeah, I mean, generally speaking, the, the funds, you know, I would say are, are in the high kind of one to, to 200% plus range over a three to five year schedule in terms of the, the, the returns that we're, we're seeing there. Um, you know, a, a lot of that comes through kind of actual distributions. Um, so, you know, typically speaking, we target somewhere in the region of a 20 to 30 percent distribution um, per year after the first year because the first year is the acquisition year so that's when you know the, the returns you know, it, it is slightly harder because you are kind of weighting that number as you go in terms of making those investments but then so you know a good amount of that return actually comes from the distributions and then there's the capital appreciation you know, the balance sheet appreciation from growing the, the businesses and, and selling them further down the line uh, as well but yeah i mean we're extremely happy with the returns it's something that we started off it was very small and um, we've kind of taken a stair step approach um to growing them over the years so we didn't start off with the very first one raising 20 million dollars we started by kind of raising a very small sum learning the lessons and then uh, increasing and growing as, as we as we go so our strategy strategy overall has not changed. We like to buy, you know, again, kind of out of our own network, we like to buy businesses in that kind of one to five million range and then grow those. And as the funds grow in terms of absolute value, we just buy a few more businesses. We don't change the model. We're not suddenly buying five to $10 million businesses because they are fundamentally different challenges that you're facing in terms of uh, in, in terms of running them. So um, yeah, it is something that um, you know, has been very accretive, I would say, in, in terms of the value we can we can provide back to investors and taking a lot of the the, the lessons from from prior funds and, and similar to the, the portfolio element we were talking about earlier, you, you've learned those lessons on day one and you can apply it to, to greater returns into the future. Fantastic. Well, that's a good note to, to end on. So uh, thanks very much again for, for taking the time, Ishmael. Um, what's the Thank best you. way for people to get in contact with you or, or, or learn more about FE? Yeah, I mean, just go to feinternational.com. I mean, everything's up there. The market report is actually going to be um, available uh, you know, straight on the homepage uh, in, in the coming days, I believe. So, uh, yeah, and then from there, I mean, we have a, a fantastic team. Um, you know, they, they make me look very good. So that's uh, always a good position to be in. Um, and, and, you know, just get in touch anyway on the website or on social media. And, and you know, we, we're, we're here to, to speak to anybody. And we like to have conversations with people extremely early in the process. So there's, there's no situation where I'm not happy to jump on a 30 minute one hour phone call with somebody just to you know have a discussion around the, the future of the space or a specific business or frankly anything i mean that's really you know back to your point what does a executive chairman do as part from strategy i mean i'm here as a sounding board for lots of founders and, and entrepreneurs just to have a, a kind of conversation and, and you know really see where it goes okay great well once again thanks very much appreciate it thank you for having me on thank you Thanks again for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're listening to the podcast version of this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Please rate and review as this will allow us to grow our audience and create more shows like this one. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to be the first to know about any new episodes that we release. Until the next episode, goodbye.